Modified Mayhem in Mandan. How's everybody doing? I'm Jay Elson, and this is Midco Motorsports. There was extra prestige and prize money up for grabs at Dakota Speedway last week with IMCA Modified drivers representing a dozen states and Canada battling it out in a pair of high-profile events. The recap is this week's A Feature. <laughs> Things kicked off Thursday with the finale of the 30th annual Dakota Classic Modified Tour. Newburgh, North Dakota's Tom Barry Jr. carried a 14-point lead into the night over Ricky Thornton Jr., which guaranteed him the title with a finish of 13th or better. That meant most of the pressure was actually on Thornton. He did his best to handle it, keeping the 20 car up near the front early on, although he'd eventually fall back to an eighth place finish. One of the guys that passed him? Barry, the 11X, pulls a power move in turn three, which would essentially clinch the championship. Barry came home in fifth place. Meanwhile, the guy everyone was chasing on this night was Hunter Marriott. After snagging the lead away from pole setter Jeff Taylor on lap four, the driver out of Brookfield, Missouri, kept the hammer down the rest of the way. That earned him the final feature victory of this year's tour. The stakes were even higher Friday, a record prize of $10,004 up for grabs in the annual Legendary 50. The street stocks were up first. Solid start for Bismarck's Jason Berg, who took command from the outside of row one and kept the lead for the first 10 laps. He'd get lots of company after that, though. Four wide coming out of turn four here. Not a lot of room for air, and that was bad news for Berg. He get tagged for the caution after making contact with John Weber. Weber would take control on the ensuing restart, but Todd Carter slowly reeled him in. Carter, who started ninth, goes inside to make the pass with five to go, and that would be all he needed. The Lisbon, North Dakota native goes on to claim his first ever victory at Dakota Speedway. We came out for the mod tour with Jarrett's car, and, and I, I said, ah, heck, let's bring the street car with us. I said, I love this place. If it was 100 miles closer to Lisbon, we'd be here every week, but this track is phenomenal. It, it, was, a, it was a good night. Weather started to play a role after that. Following a 30-minute delay, officials scrapped the traditional three-wide 11-row starting grid for the legendary 50 in favor of a two-wide 17-row layout. All that meant very little to Fargo's Austin Arneson. He had his 10 car dialed in all night. Arneson turned in the fastest qualifying time in his group and won his heat race, so it was no surprise to see him take control of this thing from the start. In fact, he didn't slow down at all until he encountered traffic seven laps in. Freshly crowned Dakota Classic Mod Tour champ Tom Berry Jr. looking to capitalize on that. He'd do it briefly on lap 14, but Arneson able to answer before the lap is complete. He was still leading when they reached the mandatory midway break, and big news there. With more weather threatening, track officials decided to shorten the race by 10 laps. That meant Arneson would only have to hold on for 17 more, and guess what? That's exactly what he did. Austin Arneson caps an incredible night with one of the biggest victories of his career. That's my biggest paying win. Uh, I beat it by three dollars. Um, you know, and it's just fun. I, I like coming out here. It's my first one out here. I've wanted to win out here bad, and uh, it's a good one to win. Coming up, a young North Dakota driver is going all in on racing. We'll learn a little bit more about the next step in the career of Fargo's Tim Estenson when Midco Motorsports rolls on. Midco Motorsports on Midco Sports Network is presented by Dakota Speedway. While the local dirt tracks in the Dakotas offer extremely tough competition night in and night out, many drivers hope to someday make the leap to other circuits outside the region. That has become reality for Fargo's Tim Estenson. After winning 49 races and five track championships driving in the Legends division, he is cutting his teeth in a 410 sprint car this summer racing out in California. Mick OSN's Brian Sean sat down with the 17-year-old Phenom to talk a little more about it. 
We are here at Red River Valley Speedway in West Fargo, a place that Tim Estenson, our guest today, knows very well. He grew up racing legends around here the last few years, and this year has moved up to 410 sprint cars. And uh, Tim, what went into your decision to try to move up and, and get into sprint cars after having so much success in the legends here the last few years? Well, uh, Joel Peterson actually in 2017 when the Legend Nationals were here for uh, the Nationals for the Legend cars that they have every year at the end of the year uh, just came up to me during the test session one day and was just said I want you to drive a mini sprint and I never actually thought about racing sprint cars or anything you know I just I like doing the Legends and doing what I did with my dad and you know just having like a good family bond with it and and then uh, Joel gave me the opportunity and said he wanted me to try out this mini sprint and I tried it out on the practice session during the Legends and, and then I was kind of hooked after that. I just I just liked the feel of it and the speed and just the adrenaline rush after it all and then we got it worked over through the winter and then I was doing Legends and mini sprints on the same time in 2018 and then after that I just, my uncle just got me to the thought and asked you know what about 410 sprints you know you know me I'm all excited but my dad you know he's kind of a little anxious about it because he knows how fast and dangerous they are but in the end he he thought it over through a, a long process and he uh he kind of got the hooks of it too after he saw me test this winter and you know my uncle got me the deal hooked up during the winter in 2018 and and after that it kind of just set sail and took off from there. And I know you made the decision to go out with the King of the West sprint cars on a very competitive circuit. A lot of drivers have started out there that have gone on to do some really great things. What was your decision to, to go out west and go out to California to do a lot of your racing this summer? Well, I know uh, my uncle's mechanic, he, he helped out get this whole process put together for out there. And uh, uh, when we talked to DJ Neto out there, the team that I'm on board with and uh, driving a car for, uh, a lot of the guys out there, it's anybody can win on a given night. It don't matter who it is. It isn't always the same person winning over and over and over. There's you get, The competition level is just so high out there, and they all take it so very serious, and, and they take it serious everywhere too. But uh, out there, anybody can win on a given night. and uh, Yeah, and all the tracks, the tracks are constantly changing from heat race to qualifying to feature time to B mains are constantly changing and uh, and you're also learning in the process too of uh, different track types throughout the country so and you've only been in the seat now just a handful of times you're still getting used to it but you're still getting better I think every week what's been the toughest part of transitioning into sprint cars a lot more horsepower I know that yeah definitely coming from a legend car that's only a uh, four cylinder with 125 horse going to 950 horsepower is a big jump for me but uh, uh just the g-force in it and uh is uh pretty tough for me because you're going that's you're just sprinting to the end all all the time you're always sprinting and i mean that's why i think they call them sprint cars in my opinion but uh yeah just the hardest part for me was honestly the horsepower you got so much wheel spin coming out of the corner and it's just uh it's just crazy the amount of power that you can get and the top speeds you can get out of it and i mean i got a great group of guys out there that are teaching me and teaching me what to do and a great crew chief and uh i couldn't be any more appreciative to what they have uh, been doing for me the past six races that i've been in so so where do you hope this goes? I mean, you're still got a year of high school left, but you're, I mean, what, what are, what are the next year or two look like for you? Do you think? I'm um, hoping just to get as much seat time as I can and get more of the hang of it. And, you know, I want to run, try to run some outlaw shows and then hopefully later down the road, me and my uncle, or, uh, I know he's talked about it. Uh, it's in there. It's an idea anyways, but uh, just try and maybe start our own team and, Know, just take things back into the family family hands and do it as a family deal and have it all Estenson and racing and you know just see where everything goes it's as of right now my goal is just you know get seat time uh, finish the mains make the mains finish 30 laps consistently and then you know work my way to you know making small goals for myself 
uh, you know, get a top 10 here and then maybe work next time, you know, I'm getting top 10s consistently and then uh, work for a top five after that and then hopefully a win later in the future. Well, it's been fun to see you make this jump and uh, watch from afar. We wish you the best of luck the rest of this summer, Tim, and we'll catch up with you down the road, okay? All right, thank you. Thanks, Brian. Estenson is currently 11th in points in the King of the West NARC Sprint Car Series and has 11 races remaining in California this summer. Well, the World of Outlaws Late Model Series attempted to tame the legendary bullring on Friday. Find out who got the win in Grand Forks next. Brad Sweet's recent run with the World of Outlaws Sprint Car Series has been impressive, but it's got nothing on that of late model driver Brandon Shepard. The New Berlin, Illinois native captured 12 of the first 20 features in 2019, helping him earn over $100,000 more than anyone else on tour. He looked to add to both of those totals Friday at River Cities. Shepard would have to wait his turn, though, as the local guys, the Gnosis Sprints, took center stage first. And a couple of that group's biggest guns would put on quite a show. Mark Dobmeyer always making guys think, and Brendan Mullins certainly felt the pressure here. With the 13 hot on its heels, the 11M goes off the track in turn two. Usually it would be case closed at that point, but Austin Pierce says, hold on, he catches Dobmeyer in traffic and ultimately slides past him for the lead. Pierce was able to pull away momentarily, but Dobmeyer wouldn't go quietly. He's all over the two ways bumper on the final lap, but Pierce able to power around the top and secure his second straight win at RCS. The guests rolled out next. Brandon Shepard third on the starting grid for the World of Outlaws 50 lap feature. Shane Clanton emerged as the early front runner in this one, but as soon as he got into traffic, Shepard pounced. A brief back and forth ensues before Shepard finds the speed he needs to gain the edge for good. Former Bullring regular Ricky Weiss came into the night hoping to snap Shepard's streak in front of the partisan crowd, and while he'd have a handful of chances off restarts, this would be as close as the seven car would get. Weiss would have to settle for second while Shepard rolls to his fifth straight victory. To West Fargo now, capacity crowd on hand for racing at the Red River Valley Fair. Doug Gardner and the IMCA Sport Mods led things off and this would be a refreshing change of pace for the 41. Gardner hadn't finished better than sixth in his last four starts at the track, but he'd break out of that funk in a big way. The Glendon, Minnesota native fought off a couple of different challengers on his way to a well-earned wire-to-wire win. Uh, honestly, I just didn't lift. I held it wide open the whole time. I mean, I've been struggling with the car. Shane Lasky's been helping me big time. I mean, he basically built it. Um, we did a few changes tonight, put a different offset rim on it, and it worked awesome. Things would be much more intense in the NOSA Sprints feature. Pick it up on lap 11, where Thomas Kennedy replaces Mark Dobmeyer at the front. He would not be the last to lead, however. A couple trips later, Nick Omdahl charges by everyone on the bottom, giving him the top spot with 11 to go. Omdahl looked to be on his way before a late caution reopened the door for Dobmeyer, and Dynamite blows it down. Dobmeyer gets the lead back, and this time he keeps it, holding on for his first ever victory at Red River Valley. We were running the top, and Omdahl passed us all on the bottom, made us look silly, and. Uh, and uh, I just didn't have it, and I got my wing back a little bit more. We had a good car underneath us, and the driver just had to get it to where it needed to be. And uh, then off that last restart, I knew there was, I only had one crack at it. It was the barrel that didn't wide open on the top of one, and uh, try swinging around and get that momentum going, and I had just enough to pull it off. Drivers from two of the region's top 360 tours battled for bragging rights in North Sioux City over the weekend. We'll share the highlights from Park Jefferson after this. Mother Nature claimed an awful lot of early season events across our region, including the annual North-South Sprint Car Shootout featuring the Nebraska and MSTS 360s at Park Jefferson. Saturday, they circled back, and this time, it went off without a hitch. Plenty of sugar to go around beforehand in North Sioux City, but the sweet taste of victory would be a little harder to come by. 
We'll pick it up with the night's main event. Brandon, South Dakota's Tommy Barber rockets into the lead from the pole. The 75 machine would build a healthy lead over the first few laps, but he'd lose his cushion with a little slip on the back stretch here. Cody Ledger tries to take advantage, but he can't quite make the pass. Barber dodged that bullet, but he could not outrun the caution flags. A total of five of them would fly over the next few circuits, and that eventually caught up with the leader. Barber didn't wreck, but he did get past. Ledger gets the job done on lap 12, and from that point forward, it was all 35L. Cody Ledger leads the final 13 laps en route to his first MSTS win of the year. To the sport mods now, it was a physical night at the front. Five laps in, Connor Vandeweerd has the lead, Jeff Brunson wants it, and the 21 wasn't going down without a fight. Vandeweerd with a straight up body slam in turn four, although it wasn't enough to keep the double OX in check. The battle didn't stop there for Brunson, though. More contact on a restart with five to go as he tried to drive through the 25C of Cody Thompson. The points leader stood his ground, though, and he would close it out from there. Thompson collects his sixth win in seven starts at Park Jefferson. For some, scaling racing down to a more manageable size is the only way to make the sport work. We'll look at one of the more popular ways to get an affordable fix when we come back. Midco Motorsports on Midco Sports Network is presented by Dakota Speedway. Passion or price tag? Any race car driver will tell you that if you want to race around a dirt oval in the summer, your passion for the sport has to outweigh your concerns for the price tag attached to it. But there is another alternative to getting that racing fix while operating on a smaller budget. In this week's Inside Track, presented by Dakota Speedway, Midco SN's Jody Norstead shows us how radio control racing continues to be a hit for racing purists of all ages in the Fargo-Moorhead area. It's a summer night just off Highway 10 in Dilworth, Minnesota. Oh no! Last minute adjustments are being made to cars. Too much droop? Yeah. Don't you think? Then it's time for the fastest show on turf. Fast, fun. 10 year old Dayton Kent is at the track for the first time. So once you get that in there, can I test it? I'm dying. But he's no stranger when it comes to the sport of racing. It's fun to work on it because my dad's a race car driver and that that I get to work on this thing. And while dad might be the veteran behind the wheel, be ready. Dayton has forged his own passion for racing. And as you can see, he's not alone. I like wrenching on him and stuff. I mean, that's my hobby of the hobby, you know. I've always had that competitive uh, feel, just wanted to compete, loved driving cars, loved going fast. Every Tuesday and Thursday night in the summer, anywhere from 15 to 30 drivers show up with their radio control car to put their skills to the test as part of the Red River Radio Control Car Club. Their goals are just like the people racing the big cars. Drive fast, try to avoid damage, sometimes, and go for the win. We kind of grew up with it, other kinds of full-scale racing, and uh, so it was, it, it's natural. There's no risk of this. Um, but you still get that adrenaline rushing. Race nights are also set up similar to the local dirt track. They have different divisions. So this is the four-wheel drive class. That's a little bit more to get into, but this is a two-wheel drive stock buggy. This is a stadium truck, and this is a, a mini class car. And they go through their heats, followed by the feature to cap off the night. GJ, have you passed me twice yet? Oh, oh that's gonna be it. Oh. Now these aren't the cars you got for Christmas when you were little that broke a couple months later. So if I want to make any adjustments to the steering, I can go into channel one and you know, turn the steering further left, further right. These are much different. The price tag for the cars you'll see on this track on a given night started around $150. And you can end up investing as much as $1,500 into a car. It was something I could afford to get into versus say a, a, a stock car or dirt bikes or stuff like that. The, the barrier to entry is much lower on an RC car than anything else. It's so warm out today that I'm gonna have to put new Velcro tape on here. There may not be money on the line, but that doesn't diminish the big time feel 
For starters, the turf course, complete with the ramps and jumps, was purchased from Illinois. And underneath is a transponder timing system that works similar to what you see at the local dirt track. Danny with a 11, 518, Dayton 7, 521. It can get down to the hundredth of a second, like nose to tail, swapping back and forth for six minutes racing, and that's, you come off the stand, just hands are shaking. It's, it's exhilarating. Yeah. And for the guys racing on this night, it's about more than racing. Whether you're with family. My brother and I are closer than we've ever been just because of this. Or treating this group as a family. I love meeting new people. It all makes for a fun time with some learning lessons along the way. Don't try to double jump that jump because um, I usually flip and break my car when I do that. <laughs> Now the club is scheduled to host its annual Midwest Outdoor Turf Track Championships during Dilworth's Loco Days on Thursday, July 25th, and they welcome anyone to come check it out. If you're interested in joining the group, you can find out more information on their Facebook page. All right, that is our time for this week. Here's a quick look at what's coming up over the next couple of weeks. Hope to see you back here next Wednesday night for another episode of Bingo Motorsports.